Well, I'm excited this morning. We are going to be launching into a new sermon series titled Baptist Distinctives. Baptist Distinctives. And the message this morning will be the first of several such distinctives that we are going to look at over the course of the next few months. But the very first one that we're going to talk about today is biblical authority. I wanted to give you the title because I think that will help you understand the verse that we're going to read this morning as our starting point. Psalm 119, verse 105. There aren't very many people here in person this morning, but for those who are, when you find it, Psalm 119, 105, if you would please stand for the reading of God's word. This is a verse that in the past, when we did scripture memory five years ago, this was one of the verses that we sought to memorize. If you don't have it memorized, it's a good day to memorize it today. Psalm 119, 105 says the following, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The psalmist says, David says, that God's word is the illumination that lights up the darkness of the world and the darkness of sin, the darkness of corruption that is all around us. But the word of God lights up, lights up his path. It is a light to his feet so that he not only has illumination, but now he has clarity of direction and purpose and instruction for life. What a wonderful description. You know, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. And you know what it is? It is a entire chapter about the Word of God. The wonder, the glory, the beauty, the remarkable nature of God's Word. No wonder it's the longest chapter in the Bible, because that's a, that, that, there's a lot of good stuff there, right? The Bible. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your Word. Lord, as we open it and study it this morning, I pray you'd speak to our hearts through it. Lord, that we might not only hear your Word, Lord, but that we might be transformed by your Word. And then we might go out of here not only heard it, not only having heard your voice, Lord, but having been changed by it. For we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. As you're being seated, let me again tell you that our new series that we're starting this morning is called Baptist Distinctives. This will be a topical series, meaning that we're not going to turn to a particular place and start and go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We will do that again later this year when we get to our upcoming study of Revelation, which I'm really excited about. But for this winter and spring, for these next few months, we're going to do a topical study where we will be kind of bouncing around uh, covering a particular topic. And the topic of interest is Baptist distinctives. Now, during this series, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at and summarizing certain doctrines and beliefs and practices that are held particularly by Baptists. Baptists are one of many Christian denominations. There are a multitude of various Christian denominations, and Baptists are just one of those denominations. And all Christians share some common convictions. That's what makes them Christian. We share them with one another. And the reality is that probably we have more in common with one another than we realize. Unfortunately, it's human nature to, to uh, try to harp on differences rather than to rally around commonalities. That being said, 
We are going to talk about differences. See, I told you it was human nature, right? In this limited series, we will focus exclusively on those particular beliefs that are most closely associated with Baptist faith and practice. So we're not going to talk about everything that Baptists believe. We're going to talk about a few things that are very particular and distinctive to our denomination. In other words, what makes Baptists uniquely different from other Christian denominations? Now, let me say this at the very, very beginning. It is not my intention with these messages, or ever for that matter, to disparage or discount in any way the sincerely held beliefs of other Christian groups and other Christian persuasions. The fact of the matter is that I am absolutely certain that they are just as earnestly convinced about their religious positions as we are as Baptists about our positions. And they would vigorously and passionately defend their convictions just as we defend ours. And I would expect no less. But that being said, there is no denying that there are marked differences between the faith and practices of various Christian churches. This disparity is not necessarily an issue of right and wrong. The, the purpose of this series is not to point out who's right and who's wrong. It's not the purpose. The purpose of this series is simply to point out what makes Baptist distinct. Nothing more, nothing less. Now obviously, as a Baptist, I choose to follow Baptist doctrine because I think they're the closest to correct. But I would think that my Methodist brothers and sisters and my Episcopalian brothers and sisters and my whatever brothers and sisters follow theirs because they believe theirs is closest to correct. And so let's not get into right and wrong. What makes us different? That's it. That's my intention, not to disparage anyone else. Several years ago, I preached a lengthy collection of messages when I very first came to Calvary, me and my family. It was a series called What Do Baptists Believe? And you can still go back and read those messages from 2014. They're available on our website. And we covered the entire Baptist faith and message, which is the entire statement of faith for Southern Baptists. This series will be much shorter than that. Because the scope of this series is much more narrow. That being said, we will recover some of that same ground as we did before, albeit from a different angle. So, I'm not preaching these sermons to be needlessly redundant. But rather to remind us and reinforce us of some basic beliefs that make us who we are as a peculiar people. These things are important these things are foundational. These things need to be repeated from time to time. The most important things you tend to say more than once. As you should. And so, with that, we launch into our study of Baptist distinctives. And the first one, as I said at the outset, arguably the most important one of them all, is biblical authority. The reason I say it is arguably the most important is because all of the other distinctives that we will talk about over the course of the next couple of months rest on this one. Biblical authority. Baptists. Baptists historically have believed and held this position. The Bible. The Bible. 
the written word of God is the sole, supreme, sacred, settled, and sufficient authority for all matters Amen. of religious faith and practice. In short, Baptists believe that every question of life, whether small or great, comes down to this. What does the Bible say about it? What does the Bible say? This morning we're going to take a few minutes to go through some of the descriptors I just used regarding biblical authority. Number one, it is the soul authority. Soul, S-O-L-E. Baptists recognize the Bible as the one and only authoritative source for all aspects of Christian life. While creeds and confessions may be useful in some contexts, they do not in any way serve as a viable substitute for the Word of God itself. Baptists have long rejected creeds throughout their history. That doesn't mean the creeds don't have some value. You've heard the Apostles' Creed. You've heard the, uh, the Nicene Creed or the Nicene Creed, depending on how you say it, and other historical creeds. Uh, we've even probably said them before in our various uh, experiences in Christian life. A couple of hundred years ago, Baptists themselves even came up with a covenant. A version of the covenant is here on our wall. It has value to the extent that it summarizes and kind of conceptualizes some of our beliefs. But listen to me. We are not a creedal people. We are not a confessional people. Our confession, our creed is the Bible. The Bible alone. Likewise, theological commentaries. Oh, I, I spend a lot of time reading commentaries by people who are much more learned and studied than I am. And they have wonderful insight. And they have wonderful perspectives and interpretations of Scripture. And their commentaries are useful to me and to countless others. Not only commentaries per se, but all sorts of religious books and writings. All sorts of DVD series or video series or YouTube videos or in-person conferences. All sorts of teachings that you can get from all sorts of places. They are useful for interpreting and for understanding Scripture. But listen, they are not ever an alternative to Scripture. Never. No human opinion, including those expressed by the most learned and respected and highly exalted religious leaders, No decree of any church group or convention or council. That would include all of the ecclesiastical conventions and bodies that have ever existed. From a small church business meeting, gathering of the deacons or the trustees, all the way up to uh, 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 a continental council of all the wise and learned sages coming together. None of those things, no religious traditions, 
handed down from the church or somebody of the church. No customs, no liturgies, no rites or rituals. Indeed, no other thing supplants the Bible. It is the sole authority for Christian life. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, Paul and those that were with him at that time came to the vicinity of Berea and they began preaching the gospel to the people there. And scripture tells us in Acts 17, verse 11, now these people, that is the Bereans, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, the nearby town, for, for they received the word with eagerness. Now listen to this last part. Examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Listen, this is Paul. Perhaps the, the greatest teacher uh, of all time. Other than Jesus himself. This guy has tremendous Tremendous credibility and insight. He's preaching, and what are they doing? They're listening, but they're saying, let's go home and check. Let's check the, the authority. And make sure. Now, granted, they didn't have the full Bible, but they had the Old Testament, and they were checking. And they were setting an example for us. Beloved, if, if, I could, if I could bring Billy Graham back from the dead and put him right here today and let him preach for you, or if I could get uh, John MacArthur to come, or, or Dr. David Jeremiah to come, or, or you name it, some renowned, respected, honored Bible teacher to come and preach to you today, how many of us would go home after they preached and double check to make sure that what they said was right. You see, it doesn't matter who you are. The Bible is the sole authority for Christian life. Number two, it's the supreme authority. Now, this kind of goes along with the sole authority. But I want to point out not that it is the only source. But I also want to point out that it is the highest source of authority for all matters of life. Beloved, in this world there are many voices that seek to exert influence and or control over our lives, our thoughts, our speech, our decisions, our actions, beloved, every aspect of our life is subject to the influence of outside sources that are seeking to exert authority over us. To a certain degree, to a certain degree, beloved, these powers are legitimate. Your boss does have a legitimate authority over you. Your teacher does have a legitimate authority over you. Your principal does have a legitimate authority over you. Your government does have a legitimate authority over you. To the extent, hear me, to the extent that those authorities are executed consistent with the word of God and to the extent that they are rightly derived from and aligned to the word of God. The Bible says that all authority is from God. But that does not mean that every authority is of God. What that means is that all legitimate authority, 
all authority that actually is authority is from God. But if it's not from God, then it's not legitimate. There are a lot of voices and authorities out there that are not consistent or aligned with Scripture. And thus, they are illegitimate and non-authoritative. The Bible always, always holds supreme and absolute authority over all other would-be authorities. Always. The teachings and truths and commands of Scripture take precedence above everything else. It's the supreme authority. Let me give you but one of many examples. Peter and the apostles in the book of Acts were preaching the word of God, preaching the gospel message to the people, and the authorities took them into custody, and the long and short of, them is, short of it is they told them to stop it, that they were causing problems, that they were breaking the law, that they were not to preach the gospel anymore, period, or else. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Scripture says, But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Yeah. We respect you. We respect the position we you hold. We understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And we're not here to incite violence. We're not here to cause a, a, a scene. But we will do what God says regardless of the consequences because His Word is the supreme authority. God's word is the sole authority. God's word is the supreme authority. Why? Because Baptists believe that God's word is the sacred authority. I could give you a ton of verses. Let me give you three just real quick. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Paul writes to the Thessalonican Christians. For this reason we constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God from what you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of mere men, but for what it really is, the word of God, yeah. which is at work in you who believe. Listen, it's not just the word of men. It's not just my description of God. It's not just my interpretation of God. It's not my teachings about God. Listen, this is the word of God. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is not man's opinion. This is not man's commentary. This is the inspired word of God. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of the soul and the spirit of both joints and marrow to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Listen, the Bible is active in a person's life. It's not a dead word that you read and you say, well, that was amusing or that was interesting or that was informing and you set the book down and you go on about your life and, it, and, that, and that's it. No, it gets in you. Yeah. And it lives in you. Yeah. And it grows and it matures and it transforms your life.
Baptists believe that the Bible was written by divinely inspired men who were moved by the Holy Spirit to record the very words of God. We call that inspiration. It is God-breathed. These are not just these, these are not just words. These are God's words. Spoken to us. As such, it possesses the authority of God himself. The Bible is also infallible and inerrant. Meaning that it is totally true and completely trustworthy. Amen. It will not lead you astray. You can trust the word of God. It will not take you down the wrong path. Yeah. The contents of scripture are timeless. What does that mean? That means they are always relevant. Yeah. They are always contemporary in each generation. Last year when we were studying about the patriarchs who lived 2000 B.C., 4,000 years ago, the truths and the principles and the words that we talked about then are just as relevant to us today yeah. as they were to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because truth is timeless. The Word of God is powerful. And effective to always accomplish what it intends. Amen. The word of God does not return void. It accomplishes things. It does things. It is not static. It is dynamic and powerful to change and transform a life. The Bible is a sacred text. It's not of human origin. It bears supernatural traits of the divine and perfect author who, who wrote it, God Almighty, and it is from God Almighty from whom it derives its credibility. The Word of God is fully and flawlessly embodied, by the way, in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is the sole authority. It is the supreme authority because it is the sacred authority. Here's another point. It is the settled authority. The settled authority. Baptists recognize the Bible as the final and unchanging authority for all matters of religious faith and practice. What do I mean by that? I mean that its contents have been determined. They are settled. They do not evolve over time. The Bible, as it is, and the contents that are therein, are not open to be edited, to be modified, to be appended, or retracted, or altered, or updated <laughs> in any way. Amen. Listen. Baptist, like every denomination, can have healthy debate and deliberation over the precise meaning of certain biblical verses and passages. But they do not purport to change them. There are not additions to the scripture. <laughs> New updates. Changes. No. No, 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 no. The Bible is a settled authority. Listen. There are a variety of opinions. A variety of opinions. Even in Baptist circles. Regarding the method. Or methods. The manners. Even perhaps the frequency with which God still speaks to believers today. There's a variety of opinions. 
even among Baptists. But all Baptists do agree on this central point, that the Bible is the full and immutable revelation of God. Amen. That being said, all other subjective, personal, for lack of a better word, charismatic, Voices or impressions or feelings that we might attribute to God or to the Holy Spirit can only be considered valid if they contain no new or additional revelation. Because if they contain new revelation, then that means the Bible was not complete. We needed more. If they contain additional revelation, that means the Bible is not the final authority. There are additional authoritative truths that we need to know. If we're going to say as Baptists, which by the way we do, that Jesus Christ is the full and complete revelation of God, well, if he is the full and complete revelation of God, then any voices that we hear from God cannot be additional or new to what we already have. What am I saying? I'm saying that the Holy Spirit does not provide us with new instructions or new directives or new teachings or new truths. What he does is he guides us on the basis of reminding us and pointing to us things that... God has already spoken and given to us. Amen. The Bible is a settled authority. In his letter, Jude wrote the following in Jude 1 verse 3. Behold, I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, and I felt the necessity to write to you appealing to that you earnestly contend for the faith, the faith meaning the sum total of all that we as Christians believe. Our faith, our practices, our instructions, everything, our doctrines. He says, I appeal to you earnestly that you contend for the faith that, now hear this last part, was once and for all time handed down to the saints. Once and for all time, it is settled. It doesn't change. It is a settled authority. Lastly, it is the sufficient authority. The sufficient authority. Baptists recognize the Bible as the complete and sufficient authority for all areas of life. It contains every moral truth, every standard, every instruction, every promise. It contains everything necessary for proper Christian faith and practice. Listen, there is nothing missing. Nothing left out. I've, I've, I've been, you know, going to church and, and studying the Bible, and, and, and I've been in I've been in church my whole life. I'm certainly by no stretch a perfect Christian, but I can say that I have spent a lot of time in God's Word, and I can tell you this: there are a lot of things that I wish I knew that I don't know. There are a lot of things that are not in the Bible. There are questions that I have about God. There are questions that I have about heaven. <laughs> there are questions I have about church life. There are questions I have about fatherhood. There are questions I have about virtually all aspects of of life that I don't necessarily have the answers to and that the Bible doesn't give me. 
It doesn't give me everything I want to know. But I'll tell you what it does do. It gives me everything I need to know. Something that I have discovered over the course of my life is that there are some things that are better off not knowing. <laughs> there are some things that if you know them, they're actually a hindrance to you. There are some things that I suspect if God was to tell us, we could not fathom it. There are some things that if God was to tell us, we couldn't understand it. We couldn't handle it. It would be too much for us. It would do more damage than good. The Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know, but it gives us everything we need to know in order to live rightly for God and to serve Him as He calls us to. Now, that being said, follow me now. If the Bible is a sufficient authority, and it is, and it tells us everything that we need to know, for life. Now, this is important. Then there's no reason for us to look elsewhere for answers. There's no reason for us to look elsewhere for answers. Because everything we need is here. Where the Bible speaks, we are wise to listen and to obey. What did we just sing? Trust and obey. Yeah. That, that's what we do. Where the Bible speaks to those issues and those questions and those arenas of life, we do what the Bible says. And where the Bible is silent, and there are some areas where the Bible is silent, we are free to follow our conscience in keeping with the other general principles of Scripture that are universally applied to our life. If the Bible doesn't give us the answer, we don't need to make up an answer because we don't need the answer. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be there. Mm -hmm. Beloved, we should not seek answers from other non-biblical worldly sources. Amen. I may take heat for this statement, but I'll say it anyway. If you're depressed, the answer is not psychological counseling. The answer is the Word of God. Amen. If you're addicted to some substance, I'm sure that these classes or these groups can be helpful. But ultimately, the answer is the Word of God. I'm not saying that you shouldn't avail yourself of those things, but I'm saying that they are incomplete. If you are struggling with the questions in life, you don't need to go to all of these other worldly sources. The truth, the sufficient authority is found in the Word of God. Yeah. Maybe if we'd spend less time seeking answers everywhere else and spend more time in the Bible, our lives would go better. Biblical authority. Baptists have been called the people of the book. That's a nickname that has been given to Baptists by other
Christian groups and denominations. I think that's a very flattering nickname. Because what it refers to is the Baptist position, stringent and uncompromising stance on biblical authority. Baptists insist that all of their beliefs, that all of their practices mirror those that are taught in Scripture. We believe what it says. We practice our practices by what it says and how they're done in Scripture. And we do not elaborate or make up or add to or alter it. That's the goal. Baptists aspire to follow the model set by the New Testament church as closely as we possibly can. Therefore, Baptists are not overly concerned with religious trappings. They're not overly concerned with ornate cathedrals or structures. They're not overly concerned with ancient relics. They're not overly concerned with church traditions or with the opinions of some hierarchical structure. And we're going to deal with some of these issues as we progress through this series. Baptists are concerned first and foremost about biblical consistency and fidelity. Let me sum up. Baptists hold the Bible as the sole authority. That means there's no substitute or alternative. It's the only one. The supreme authority meaning it is the highest standard of all would-be authorities in our life. The Bible is the supreme authority. It is the sacred authority meaning it is inspired. It is infallible. It is inerrant. It is a divine book. It is God's word, and it is absolutely true and trustworthy. The settled authority, it does not change. It is timeless, and its truths are absolute and unchanging. And a sufficient authority, it contains everything that we need to know to live in this life. And I didn't give you that scripture, but that scripture is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is useful for teaching, for uh, rebuke, for training in righteousness, for correction, so that the word of God may be equipped, thoroughly equipped and capable of every good work. The Bible is sufficient to equip us for every good work in life, in church, outside of the church. The Bible is sufficient. So, seeing that we as Baptists have historically held the Bible in such high regard, would it not seem reasonable to expect that we of all the different denominations, the people of the book, would spend ample time reading, studying, and memorizing scripture. Doesn't that seem reasonable? And yet sadly, it's not the case. Biblical illiteracy is not just rampant in Christian churches, but in particular in Baptist churches. And not surprisingly, our ignorance of scripture and our unwillingness to adhere to the the words that we say are the authority of our life have caused all sorts of problems within the church. What a great and tragic irony that the people of the book so readily neglect the book. That said, here's my invitation and my challenge, not for just this week, but for the rest of our lives. I urge you and I collectively together, individually, in our homes. I urge us to read the Bible every day. At least for a few minutes. Allow it to become the authoritative guide for your life. 
holy trust in the word of God, which is manifested, beloved, not only in our written scriptures, but in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because this book and our Savior, the Word of God, is the authority and has the answer for every issue in our life. Amen. And it will never he will never fail us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. I pray that we would treat it in our practical living with the same respect that we give it in our preaching and our teaching. That our profession about the Bible would be our practice in regard to the Bible. And that we would hold it up as the supreme authority for our life. And we would aspire to live as closely to the precepts written in Scripture as we possibly can. Let that not just be a Baptist position. Let it be our personal mission to be a person of the book. Before we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.